Hello, class. Uh, Professor Mandeville back, of course. It, this is lecture number eight for History 102. And as you remember, when we left off in lecture number seven, uh, we were talking about President McKinley being shot by anarchist Leon, who I can't pronounce his last name, at the Pan Am Exposition uh, in September of 1901. And Theodore Roosevelt, vice president, had to be located so he could be rushed to McKinley's side. And as I mentioned before, he was right here in the North Country. He was on Isle of Mont preparing to give a uh, speech at a wildlife dinner at Governor Fisk's home, the governor of Vermont, out on Isle of Mont. And that afternoon, he had toured a brand new fish hatchery that the state had opened up there. He was notified of what happened. They whisked him off, got him on a train to Buffalo, and he arrived in Buffalo, New York, and went uh, to the bedside of McKinley. And at that point, it was touch and go for President McKinley. Uh, the big problem for the physicians was they could not locate the bullet in his body. Uh, the bullet had entered his body, bounced around, and wasn't directly behind uh, the entry wound. So they had to make a big decision as to what, how to proceed medically because, uh, ironically enough, at this point in history, in 1901, there were x-ray machines, but they were revolutionary and brand new. There were only two of them in the entire world. And one of them was at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo where McKinley had been shot. But at this point, they hadn't even thought about using x-rays uh, for medical applications. So they didn't x-ray the president, which I suppose, as we'll find out, could have helped him. But from what I understand also, x-ray machines, these very first ones, gave off so much radiation. Had they used it to save his life, he probably would have died uh, in the not-too-distant future from excessive radiation exposure. So anyway, they can't find the bullet, so they decide to take the best course of action instead of doing uh, expiratory surgery on the president. They sew up the wound and they plan on leaving the bullet in him, which was common practice back in this day and age uh, before the use of x-rays. Uh, a lot of people, especially war veterans, had bullets in their bodies. To give an example, uh, President Andrew Jackson had two bullets in his body, one from a wound he was, uh, received as a veteran, he was a general in the military, as most of you probably know. The other he received as a wound when he was fighting a duel. And the problem with long-term uh, bullets in your body like that, leaving them there forever, you slowly but surely will die of lead poisoning. Now, uh, so McKinley, they leave the bullet in, they sew up the wound, and Theodore Roosevelt is doing a bedside visual every day for several days. He's staying at a friend of his house, uh, a wealthy banker in Buffalo, Ansley Wilcox's house. Uh, McKinley starts to recover from his wounds. And finally, it gets to the point where President McKinley tells Vice President Roosevelt aren't you supposed to be on vacation with your family? And Roosevelt said, yes, they're there without me. McKinley basically tells him, I'm sick of you hovering over my bed. I'm going to be fine. You need to go join your family. His family was in the middle of the Adirondacks at a friend of theirs camp uh, in Tawas. Tawas is just outside of Newcomb, New York. Some of you may be aware of where that is. <clears throat> so Roosevelt goes to join his family on their annual uh, fall vacation, early fall vacation in the Adirondacks. 
Roosevelt has six children. <clears throat> so he goes and joins them. They get back to their normal vacation activities, hiking, camping, fishing, and so forth in the middle of the Adirondacks, which Roosevelt grew up going to and dearly loved. So <clears throat> he and his couple of his sons are off on a couple day hiking, camping trip uh, into the high peaks. And unfortunately, President McKinley takes a turn for the worse. An infection had set in to the bullet wound, and now it's touch and go again. Uh, government officials go to Taos at, to the camp where Roosevelt's family was staying, trying to find him, and he's not there. His family tells him he and a couple of his sons are out camping. They're not exactly sure where, uh, but he should be back in a couple of days. <clears throat> so they're looking around for Roosevelt sort of frantically. Finally, he and his sons come stumbling down out of the mountains into the small village in Newcomb, where they go into a store to get some supplies. And that's when the storekeeper tells him that government officials have been trying to locate him. So Roosevelt rushes back to the camp at Taos, where there are officials waiting <coughs> Excuse me, and they're going to have to uh, get him back to Buffalo, but this time he's in the middle of the Adirondacks. So they put him in a horse-drawn carriage in the middle of the night. Uh, it's raining, and I don't know if you've ever driven a car from Newcomb to North Creek, New York, where the nearest train station was, but it's a pretty uh, hair-raising ride in the dark, in the rain, in a car today. You can imagine what it was like in this horse-drawn wagon. So Roosevelt arrives there. And by the way, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Adirondack Museum in Blue Mountain Lake, but they have the carriage that Roosevelt rode in that evening. And they also have the rain jacket and hat that he was wearing on display at the Adirondack Museum. If you're ever there, it's worth taking a look at. So they arrive in North Creek at the railroad station. They get Roosevelt on this special chartered train waiting for him to whisk him off to Buffalo. While on the train, they tell Theodore Roosevelt the unfortunate news. It's too late. President McKinley has passed away from his gunshot wound inflicted to him at the Pan Am Expo. So, uh, the very next day, Theodore Roosevelt will have a small inauguration ceremony, swearing him in as president in the library of his friend's house, Ansley Wilcox, in downtown Buffalo. And in on September 14th, 1901, Theodore Roosevelt will become president of the United States. Now, uh, if you uh, are ever in Buffalo, that uh, place today, the Wilcox House, with a museum built onto the side of it, is a national park, the Theodore Roosevelt inauguration site. It's a pretty neat place to visit. You can go and step into the library and they have it restored just the way it was the day Roosevelt was sworn in. And the accompanying uh, museum keys in on the Pan American Exposition that McKinley was there to visit. It's right downtown Buffalo. And in fact, uh, it's near another very historic site. Uh, it's about three and a half blocks from the famous Anchor Bar in Buffalo, New York. Many of you may be aware that at the Anchor Bar, that is the place where the Buffalo Wing was invented. And it's quite the place today to visit. Uh, celebrities from all over the world, world leaders and so forth. There's pictures plastered all over the walls of these dignitaries visiting the Anchor Bar to dine on buffalo wings at the place of their origin. So if you're ever in Buffalo, it makes a good afternoon. I know uh, 
myself and my daughters did this once, uh, tour the Roosevelt inauguration site in the morning, then walk three and a half blocks and have lunch at the Anchor Bar and visiting two historic sites, basically, uh, in one shot. Now, Roosevelt's president. And remember the words of Mark Hanna at the Republican National Convention uh, in 1900. They've come true. Now that damn wild-eyed cowboy is president of the United States. And it's going to be a very different country under his leadership. But first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about Roosevelt's life. I know quite a bit about Theodore Roosevelt because he is one of my personal heroes. He's my favorite president, and I have a great deal of respect for this man. He was born on October 27th, 1858 uh, in Manhattan. His birthplace is a national uh, park also, the Brownstone, the four-story Brownstone stone where he was born, uh, not too far from Union Square in Manhattan. It's a great place to visit. Uh, he was uh, born in 1858. The first known photograph of Theodore Roosevelt was taken on April 25th, 1865, when he was about six and a half years old. And he was hanging out the window of his grandfather's home in Manhattan, watching President Lincoln's funeral procession, procession go by his grandfather's home. So that's the first ever known photograph of young Theodore. Uh, Theodore grew up a, a weak young child uh, he barely, barely survived childbirth, and he was very sickly. He had asthma and so forth as an infant, and it was touch and go for Theodore when he was young. Uh, because of his health issues, he was sort of a weak young man, you know, young boy, always being picked on in school and so forth as the 99-pound weakling or whatever. So he went on a real exercise regimen, uh, to get himself in shape and, I suppose, stop this nonsense. Uh, because of that, when he attends college, he's going to be a college athlete, as I think I mentioned before uh, when we we're talking about the Rough Riders. Roosevelt uh, went to Harvard University. He was on the tennis team and the wrestling team, and he graduated Harvard Phi Beta Kappa, which is the highest honor society in the country, and especially the Harvard chapter, is very prestigious. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, for his senior project, wrote a book. On, he was a history major uh, and a Japanese culture minor. He wrote a book on the naval activities during the War of 1812. That book, which I have on my shelf at home, is still the definitive source on naval activities uh, that happened during the War of 1812. It's still the best book there is, and he wrote it as a senior in college. He was a brilliant man, brilliant student. As I mentioned before, uh, to sum up his early career, he was the appointed the head of the Civil Service Commission, uh, when that was uh, created in the aftermath of Garfield's assassination by President Arthur. He later went on to be the chief of police of the New York City Police. He was brought in to clean up corruption, which was running rampant during the Gilded Age. He did a great job. He parlayed that into a successful campaign for the uh, New York State Assembly, where he served. Uh, then he uh, went on to be the Assistant Secretary of Navy that we talked about, a Rough Rider, and then a Governor of New York, Vice President of the United States, then ultimately President of the United States. When Roosevelt takes over as President in September of 1901, he's only 42 years old, 
which makes him the youngest president ever to be inaugurated. John F. Kennedy uh, was the youngest president ever elected. Roosevelt was not elected. Remember, he took over uh, as vice president. So he'll be the youngest person ever inaugurated as president, younger than JFK when he was inaugurated in January of 1961. Now, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's quite a character, and I want to just tell you a little bit about how he and his family moving into the White House really changed uh, America for quite some time. Previously, uh, ever since Abraham Lincoln, presidents had been older, and there were ever never any young children in the White House. Uh, the last time kids were in the White House was Abraham Lincoln's two sons. Now, as I mentioned before, Roosevelt had six children. Roosevelt's first wife, Alice Hathaway Lee, uh, died two days after giving birth to Roosevelt's first child, Alice, named in honor of her mother. She died, died due to childbirth complications just two days after Alice's birth. And on that same exact day, which was quite a turbulent and horrible day in Roosevelt's life, his mother passed away also. So on one single day, Roosevelt went through the trauma of losing his wife and his mother. This was devastating to Roosevelt. Roosevelt went into a state of depression at this point and to sort of clear his head and be able to move forward, he decided to buy a ranch in the Dakotas. He left his young infant daughter with his sister to take care of for a while because he was incapable of doing it at this point due to his emotional state. And he went out and became a cowboy for a couple of years. Uh, this really helped him get his life back together. He made many friends, many of which who became some of the Rough Riders. Uh, and this was a, a unique chapter in Roosevelt's life. I guess that's why he's the damn wild-eyed cowboy, I suppose. So uh, Roosevelt and his second wife bring six children into the White House and uh this created a whole new scenario for America. And Americans fell in love with the Roosevelt family, especially because of the antics of these children. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's kids uh, were known for, you know, doing children's stunts. Uh, his uh, youngest son, Quentin, Roosevelt was quite a kid. He was known for throwing snowballs at Secret Service agents, carving a baseball diamond into the White House lawn. And uh, one famous story about the Roosevelt kids involves uh, Roosevelt's uh, very brave, later very brave and highly decorated son, Kermit, who served in both World War I and World War II and was very close to Theodore. Uh, Kermit, uh, came down with the measles, the hard measles back in this, you know, were prevalent back in this day and age, and they had a comeback just, uh, last year, as you remember. When you have the hard measles, you're sick for a couple of weeks. I can remember I had them when I was a child. So Kermit is restricted to his bedroom, recovering from the measles, and his five brothers and sisters feel sorry for him. So they decide to bring him in the West Wing, his favorite pet. Kermit's favorite pet was a pony. These five kids sneak this pony into the White House, into the West Wing, and into Kermit's bedroom. And some of the White House staff discovers it. And then all hell breaks loose. 
the pony escapes. It's running up and down the halls of the White House. Uh, unfortunately, you know, running into pieces of furniture and breaking and whatnot until they finally capture it and get it out of the White House. When Americans read about that story in newspapers, they loved it. It made them feel like they were in the White House. What if their families uh, were lucky enough to be elected, but like Theodore Roosevelt, or assume office like Roosevelt, and they were in the White House? They could imagine their children doing the same crazy stunts. Another thing that uh, Theodore Roosevelt used to do uh, on a weekly basis, going back to his athletic days in college, uh, he used to have wrestling matches in the East Room of the White House. The East Room, if you've ever toured the White House, is a large room where typically they have state dinners when like a visiting president, the president of France or somebody comes to visit uh, the White House and they have a dinner in their honor. That's where the dinner would be held. It's a room large enough that uh, Amy Carter, Jimmy Carter's daughter, had her senior prom there. So Roosevelt had these special wrestling mats made for the East Room. He had this small bleachers constructed that were collapsible. And that's where his six children would sit and cheer him on as he'd take on some of his old college wrestling foes who would come and visit the White House on Friday nights, much to the joy of his children, his cheering section. So these are the kind of things that the Roosevelt family brought to the White House that some of which have had never happened before and I'd be willing to bet won't happen again. Now, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, being a very young and energetic president, uh, is also out there and present all the time. He's not afraid to hold press conferences and make many speeches. And this is where the common term of the president using the quote-unquote bully pulpit comes about. Because Roosevelt wasn't afraid to talk to the American people and explain exactly what he was up to. And he becomes a champion of the American people. So uh, that pretty much sums up uh, Roosevelt's life up to the point where he was president of the United States. Uh, next lecture, <clears throat> I'm going to pick up with what Roosevelt does in his uh, two terms as president of the United States. And also this will usher in a brand new era that we're going to be studying that we'll introduce first, the progressive era. So, that's it for uh, this particular lecture. I'll be back with you shortly to talk about the Progressive Era uh, and Theodore Roosevelt's uh, accomplishments during that uh, early Progressive Era. Everybody take care. I'll talk to you soon.